Good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is um, Dr. Bruce Gellin, the President of Global Immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And we're really excited about uh, you joining us, but we're even more excited about us providing this uh, webinar for you about meeting the challenge of vaccination acceptance for, for, with immunization professionals in mind. You'll hear more about the Boost community um, later on, but this is really some, something that we're doing with the Boost community, which is part of the Sabin, the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And Boost is really designed to design for immunization professionals, and it's a community of immunization professionals. We can learn from each other uh, what works and what doesn't work, share ideas, uh, problem solve together. And we're glad that, uh, that, that you're able to join us today. Many of you are already members of the Boost community. Uh, and if you're not already, um, at the end, we'll have some information about how you can become one. So I want to talk, a, we'll, get, we'll get started here because there's a lot to discuss. And we're particularly interested in hearing your questions. I want to leave, leave time for, for significant time for discussion. So the usual, um, usually people tell you to turn off your electronic device. Don't do that here uh, because that's what we're relying on in this virtual world. But um, limit, limit, try to limit background, no, background noise and mute yourself. Raise your hand. Hopefully you're familiar with the Zoom functions by now uh, if you want to speak. You can, can submit questions through the, uh, through the Q&A and respond to questions at the chat. But when you do, it'd be great to introduce yourself so people have some sense of who you are and where you're from, because we see this as a beginning of broader conversations among all of us and among some of us. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's, let, let's get started. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've introduced myself. I want to briefly introduce the panelists who we're, we're really excited to have, have with us today um, to, to lead these discussions, and that's what they're going to be as discussions. You'll hear from Dr. Kelly Moore, uh, Adolphus Clark, and Angus Thompson. As you can see here, Kelly is the Associate Director of Immunization Education for the Immunization Action Community. And Kelly's actually been part of this community for a long time. She was with the, the she was part of the International Association of Immunization Managers, which has now become Boost. So she's quite familiar with, with the global needs as well as those in the US. Um, Adolphus Clark is the Program Manager of the EPI program at the Ministry of Health in Liberia, and Angus Thompson, a Senior Social Scientist for Demand for Immunization at UNICEF. And you'll hear more from all of them and also about some webinar series in the future uh, with that this one is kicking off. The next slide, please. So just to get people thinking about this and trying to focus on this, is think about this for a second, and this is our poll question, um, is what does misinformation mean to you? We'll take a second to, uh, to, take, to look at that. There's a poll that I can't see that I think you have. Oh, there it is, thanks. Um, so if you'll answer, answer that, we'll just take a quick look at it. So we'll see who, um, where people are thinking on this one. Yeah, uh, and, and then we'll go, we'll, we'll go from there, thanks. And, and Jamie Minchin, who is a part of the Sabin team, um, will, you'll, you may see and hear from her along the way. She'll let us know when, We've got sufficient input from the assembled uh, to see where this, uh, wh what the, 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 the sentiment is on this, on this question. Okay, so we have a winner. I guess it's a winner. <laughs> um, but, but this is, I think, a, a kicking off point. And what you're going to hear from Kelly, from Adolphus, and from Angus are nuances of all this, because there's no right and wrong answer. These are all part of what we're dealing with. So with that, uh, let's, let's move on to, to Kelly. Uh, I've introduced Kelly, and uh, here you go. Thanks. Thanks for joining us this morning, Kelly. Absolutely. Thanks. It's great to be here uh, with everyone, especially uh, having been a charter member of IAIM and now uh, a early member of the Boost community. So um, what I'm going to do is jump right on into just some simple definitions of terms so that we have a platform from which to discuss um, a vaccine hesitancy going forward this morning. Uh, this morning for me and, and around the world, it may be afternoon or evening for you. Um, so first, starting with some definitions, what do we mean simply by vaccine acceptance or hesitancy? Well, vaccine acceptance is simply the acceptance of a vaccine or series of vaccines 
people can accept some vaccines and refuse others. It's not 100% acceptance or complete refusal. It's on a continuum that ranges and, um, and it could be that they accept all, it could be that they refuse most. Vaccine hesitancy is the delay in acceptance or refusal of a vaccine even when vaccine services are available. Hesitancy is typically based on misinformed beliefs about the value of vaccines or the risks of vaccines. And factors influencing hesitancy are complex and depend on the context and as well as varying across time, place, and type of vaccine. And hesitancy also is a continuum um, and not a simple on and off switch. Next slide. Many factors uh, contribute to whether an individual is vaccine hesitant or accepting, but the predominant factors are what we call the three C's and they're shown here. The first C is complacency. Whether or not someone perceives a need or value in vaccines, someone who is very complacent doesn't really see much purpose in vaccination. Convenience is the second C, and that's how easy it is for someone to access vaccines and vaccination services. And we understand convenience is a major factor for many people around the world where it's difficult to access vaccination services. And the third C is confidence, how much an individual trusts the vaccine, the delivery system, and the provider of the vaccines. Next slide. Confidence in vaccines can also be complex. Vaccine acceptance is impacted by how confident or skeptical an individual is in vaccine. Now confidence is simply the trust in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, the system that delivers those vaccines, including immunization professionals, and the policymakers who decide on vaccines. Now the flip side of confidence is skepticism. Skepticism is the negative perception of vaccines, and that's influenced by an individual's community, their religious affiliation, their political ideology, and their personal experience with vaccines and vaccinations, as well as other factors. Next slide. Vaccine acceptance and hesitancy are global issues being discussed and approached by many groups worldwide right now. A partnership launched in 2018 between the Sabin Vaccine Institute and the Aspen Institute, the Sabin Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group is comprised of leaders across many disciplines to examine some of the most challenging vaccine related issues and to drive impactful change. Uh, it's a, a group of which I am uh, one of the members. And in 2019, the Sabin Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group addressed vaccine hesitancy laying out some actionable steps that leaders across healthcare, research, and philanthropy had in technology had it taken to, could take to build confidence in vaccines and in vaccination. Now this group meets uh, typically for three days uh, in Aspen, Colorado until the advent of, of COVID and now we're having to move virtually as well, but we meet for three days and deliberate on big ideas. This is not the time to come up with an operational plan, but to come up with some groundbreaking high level recommendations for addressing these complex vaccine science and policy problems. Uh, the first year we met, we tackled the issue of universal influenza vaccine innovation, another big thorny issue that uh, the world would like to see solved. So the very next year we jumped into vaccine hesitancy. Next slide. So why did this particular policy group choose to cover vaccine hesitancy? Well, it was a pretty clear choice for all of us in 2019. At the time of the meeting, WHO had declared vaccine hesitancy one of the top 10 threats to global health. Also in 2019, measles outbreaks were spreading around the globe with the first six months of 2019 producing more measles cases than any year since the year 2006. And finally, although vaccination is for the most part broadly accepted as a social norm, uh, we can see clearly that we are losing ground against some pre vaccine preventable diseases and we need to stop that backsliding. Next slide. After a lot of discussion, 
um, over meals and, and in the evenings, as well as all throughout the day, we settled on several key factors contributing to global vaccine hesitancy and the critical efforts needed to address it. Principal findings of the Sabin Aspen group are listed here on the slide. First, there's an urgent need to better understand the causes and dimensions of vaccine hesitancy. And while we need to understand those causes and dimensions, we also need to address vaccine hesitancy even as our efforts to understand are incomplete. So we need to be taking action now, not waiting till we understand exactly how to solve this complex problem. The third point, there is a need to improve vaccination services and reduce barriers. And I think this is one that I particularly resonated with. Oftentimes we, we attribute to people hesitancy about vaccine or misinformation, uh, skepticism about vaccines when in fact um, they may be struggling with barriers to access or other issues that we could have an impact on. And then finally, we need to, well, we need to coordinate our efforts to boost vaccine coverage. We shouldn't just let this be the responsibility of one sector, one group of people. It's not just the responsibility of immunization professionals, but it's going to require a coordinated effort. And finally, we needed a dedicated media strategy targeting the role and impact of social media. Uh, because we recognized after looking at this that, that our understanding of social media and how it works and how to influence people through social media uh, was very primitive. And uh, we really needed to rely on experts for that. Next slide. After considering the relevant research over this three-day meeting and consulting with experts and deliberating amongst ourselves, the group arrived at three big ideas that are listed here to address vaccine hesitancy. The first idea was one about structure. We felt that it would be very valuable to create a new media collaborative to serve as an interface between the vaccination community and social media platforms. As I mentioned, we recognize the vaccination community are rank amateurs when it comes to how to use social media and social media experts could amplify our messages far more effectively if we work together uh, in a structured way. The second idea was one focused on knowledge. We recognize the need for a clear research agenda to create the ample evidence-based understanding we need about the sources of vaccine hesitancy and the best ways to counter it. And then finally, we had this strategic idea, the strategy of building a new narrative to shift the conversation around immunization to one that focuses on its achievements and the promise that it holds and, and how it can help build and how to help build resiliency in the vaccination enterprise. Next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic has further complicated the issue of vaccine confidence. Caretakers are concerned about bringing their children in for immunizations and about getting well baby visits done safely. Uh, Vaccination campaigns around the world were suspended uh, for months at a time and may or may not have resumed yet. And we don't even have a COVID-19 vaccine quite yet, uh, but we're already dealing with misinformation and rumors about the vaccines that threaten future vaccine confidence. Next slide. The pandemic presents incredible challenges for each of us as immunization professionals. And in order to monitor that, the Boost community in partnership with WHO, UNICEF, and Gavi has issued pulse surveys of immunization professionals to monitor the impact the COVID-19 pandemic is having on their work. The first pulse survey in June found that almost three out of four national respondents indicated that they have seen disruptions in vaccine demand. Almost half indicated that people are concerned about the risk of exposure to COVID-19 if they go for vaccination. And again, about three out of four noted that potential rumors 
are being monitored and that 85% of countries have indicated that there are plans to put in place, there, there are plans in place to rebuild acceptance and or demand for vaccination services once they're able to safely resume. So we look, we're looking forward to more information from these periodic pulse surveys to keep track of how COVID-19's pandemic is impacting uh, the vaccination services globally. So with that, I'll close and hand this back over to Bruce to continue the, the panel discussion. Thanks. Kelly, thanks a lot. And, and again, we're, we're gonna have the discussion, the, uh, these short presentations up front and a discussion later. One comment before turning over to Adolphus on these pulse surveys. Um, in collaboration with WHO and UNICEF, there's something the Boost, Boost has been able to do. And that's actually one of the real advantages we think of, of Boost. And because those of you who, who are already members of Boost and participate in this survey, and it's a great way to, to very rapidly get uh, your, your feed from what's going on on the ground. So uh, another reason to be part of the community, not only can we give information to, but importantly to hear from you about what's going on and what some of those needs may be. So without, uh, without we'll, hear, we'll hear more about, about that later, but let me turn over to, uh, to Adolphus Clark, um, who I mentioned before is the program manager uh, the EPI program in, in Liberia, who will tell us about this from his context. Adolphus, over to you. Uh, and thank you, thank you so much, Bruce, for the opportunity. And uh, thanks everyone for joining this call and affording me the platform to share Liberia context. So uh, if you just go to the next slide, please. The next slide, please. The next slide. The next slide. The next, the next. okay. Yeah, so I'd like to begin my, my conversation around this slide to depict the, the confusion, the disruption, that misinformation brings to the system in the midst of crisis. Imagine has cut off the information out on the screen, how people are confused, and what fake news or fake information can do to a well-functioning system. So I will take you to another slide just to look at some of the quotes and then how we've been tackling the situation in Liberia. So in the midst of in the midst of all of this confusion, we were able to initiate what we call a vaccine perception study, right? And I will talk a little bit more on the vaccine perception study. But from the focus group discussion, this is how some of the respondents or participants or enrollees feel about vaccination based on the information that they gather either from community dwellers or from social media or from other platforms about vaccination. Yeah, or, or, yeah, or from, from vaccination. So you see, for instance, one, one caregiver is saying that the, the government brought in vaccine to, to kill their people, to kill their people, yeah, to, yeah, to kill their people. Why? Other people say, the vaccine is that good and this 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 so i mean i just telling you the level of confusion that we've been confronted with in terms of how to tackle information now let's go to the next slide that i will want to dwell more on i thought to make this slide blank because we should be engaging we should think outside the box and i don't want to just have structural bullet points i thought that we could share our experience more hands on and from a more practical perspective. So one of the things that we saw has been very critical when it comes to tackling misinformation has to do with building and capacitating community structures. We think that if you want to dispel or tackle rumors and or misinformation at the community level, it is extremely important to build the capacity of the community structure. Because if they don't know exactly what service or services they are providing and the benefits associated with said service or services, it's easy for people to infiltrate 
and provide misinformation. So in that community leadership building capacity, we think what is critical in our opinion is for us to firstly identify at the law of community, what are the barriers as it relates to immunization? The second thing we had to do, ask ourselves, who are the messengers? So we needed to identify the right messenger and then thoroughly to equip the communities with the right message. So that even if somebody infiltrated the community with wrong information, a community dweller is able to stand up and say, no, this is not true about vaccination. Vaccine is safe, vaccine is good. Vaccine can provide protection. Vaccine can do this, this, this. So we think that it's very important that we look at the issue of building capacity as it relates to community structure. The other thing that we think is also very critical, not waiting for firefighting move or not waiting for misinformation to set in. How can we ensure that community engagement becomes an integral part of our health care system? We think it's extremely important. We have platforms that we can and should leverage upon to ensure that community engagement takes a center stage in terms of how we tackle misinformation at that level. So some of the thought processes and some of the engagement we've done so far is to work with what we call the community health assistance platform. Because through this platform is where you have community health workers at the community level providing community health services. So if we are able to also capacitate them and leverage on their, their platform, we think that misinformation or rumors may not even try for a very long period of time because these foot soldiers will be able to provide the needed information to counteract any misinformation in the community without even having central level involvement. So we think that this is very critical. The other piece that we also Adolphus, we're losing your sound just a little bit. I think your connection is going a little. Do you maybe want to try going without video so we can hear you? Okay, I think Adolphus, we may have lost briefly, um, but I think what we can do is um, go to a Q&A section. Um, so just a reminder for attendees that you can raise your hand and um, I see we have a hand raised, so we'll get to you in just a moment. Um, but you can also use the Q&A function to submit questions that we can do with panelists. And also um, you can submit comments into the chat. Um, so while, and I think Adolphus has just come back. Um, Adolphus, can you, can you hear us? And can we hear you? Let me, <clears throat> let me this is Bruce again. Let me, so we'll. Hello? Oh, good. Good, Adolphus here. We can hear you again. Uh, maybe I guess if everyone goes off of video, including me, maybe that'll help. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm hearing you. Can I continue? It's better. Hello? It's better, but not perfect. I think it's getting better. So, Adolphus, back to you. You were talking about, I think we lost you when you were talking about the importance of- Hello? Link. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, this is Bruce. 
All right, yeah, and thank you, Bruce. So, and like I was saying, the, the third thing that is also very critical was that. Yes, yes, I'm hearing you, yes. I am hearing you. I'm hearing you, Bruce. Yeah, we're, we're getting just only some of you, Adolphus. Um, can you, you, can you, can you hear me? You. Yes, I'm hearing you, Bruce. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Just clear now. Keep going. Okay. Excellent. So I was saying that um, in the midst of misinformation or romans or myth, I think what is also critical is to be able to conduct an exploratory or formative research as a way of documenting the level of penetration because just visiting or moving through communities and hearing that oh there exists misinformation about vaccination is not sufficient in guiding the action or actions to be taken so one of the things that we did was to conduct what we call a vaccine perception study the intent of this study at the time was to give us a better insight in terms of how deeply rooted this misinformation or misperception or myth about vaccination is and what we need to do differently to tackle said misinformation. So we think that having a more structural approach to documenting events and or getting empirical data as it relates to misinformation is very critical. So when we conducted the, the vaccine perception study April 24th to the 10th of May, it, it was able to give us a broader perspective of how communities dwell us uh, thinking or what they thought about vaccination in the midst of COVID. And that led us to developing what we call race communication strategic action plan. So having identified all of the issues relating to communication barriers or the misinformation, we were able to identify the appropriate channels or medium through which this information could be counteracted or could be overturned. And then we were able to identify who were the true messengers when it comes to the information dissemination, at what level is that messenger best suited, and then look at the cost implication because it's not just about identifying the level of penetration about the misinformation, but also ensuring that you have a robust approach to tackling same misinformation is very critical. So we were able to cost this strategic action plan and they came up to a little over 100,000, after which we made a formal presentation to our immunization partners to say, this is the finding or these are the findings from the report that we we conducted this is why it takes us as a country to be able to address this issue in terms of overturning whatever misinformation about immunization that will subsequently lead to high uptake of immunization services so resource availability is very critical in tackling women that brings me to my fourth point. So I talked about capacitating. No, that's, that's my third point. I talked about capacitating. I talked about integration. And then the third one is the issue of having a more exploratory information in terms of study on the magnitude of the misperception. And then the fourth is about resource availability. In the absence of having available resources to be able to address misinformation it makes it difficult to go any further because behavior change is not an overnight thing. And so this requires a great deal of resources in terms of what are the issues identified and how you intend tackling it. Now, if the issue identified is centered around a robust approach to community engagement, then you need to have a full-fledged community engagement plan and budget clearly costed and funds available 
in the absence of having a sure or secure funding, it becomes very difficult to tackle misinformation because it's not just going on air and saying, oh, vaccines are safe. It's about sitting with the communities, making them the center of immunization and why they need to trust the system, why they need to believe in vaccination services, what benefits vaccine provide for their child or children of the community. So we think these are very critical piece that we need to be aware of when we are tackling or handling misinformation as it relates to vaccination. So uh, I will stop here then, Bruce, for any comment, question, concern. Over. Well, Adolphus, that, thank you for that. And, and um, we've been staring at your whiteboard here, taking, taking notes about these important things that you said. Let me just summarize a few of them before we go on and we want to come back to them. The importance of community engagement. And I think the, an important factor is community engagement is to really to understand what the community is worth and not just to figure out, is this a focus group on how to communicate to them? It's about true engagement. And then the uh, importance of planning, to have a risk communication plan and to be able to execute yeah. that plan and for all of it. And, and the, the importance of being nimble and facile and doing research on the ground to try to better understand some of these. And for all of these to have a budget to be able to do it because you can't do it on the fly. Really important, important um, concepts. We're gonna get back to some of this, but let me, let me move over to, to Angus, um, who's gonna lead us, he's gonna pick up on many of these strands. Um, and then wanted to, um, to sort of have a, a broader discussion about misinformation. And when you listen to Angus, also think about the, we'll talk about later, an, another webinar series, because he'll tell you a number of things which you want, we're gonna wanna hear more about in more depth in a future series that we'll talk about later. Angus, over to you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Adolphus. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining the call Hi. today. Um, uh, I think, I, I mean, Bruce reiterated the key points that Adolphus made, which are really, really important points. Um, the resource availability made me think of what happened here in France in the H1N1 pandemic, when France uh, did everything right, prepared for the pandemic by buying uh, 96 million doses of vaccine to vaccinate 75% uh, of the population, including, you know, two doses for those who are at greater risk which was really the right thing to do. We didn't know where it was going, but they made no real investment in the implementation of the program and in particular, the communications and engagement around the program. And they ended up using 6 million of those doses, not even 5 million. So I think Adolphus's point is an important point at a country level or sort of global level. Uh, we all need to be advocating for resources to enable us to tackle uh, misinformation and to build uh, demanding communities. Um, and, you know, we need the resources because we need to do this through a systematic, structured, um, evidence-based way, I think, as Adolphus touched upon as well. Um, I might just jump to two of the questions that I'm seeing here. I'm going to have a shot at answering two of these, and then I'll open up the floor to the, to the panel to see if they would like to um, add anything. First of all, from Christine um, Miano, who asks, what are the communication challenges amid COVID-19? Um, in a sense, in a sense, uh, the question is, what aren't the challenges? Uh, there's a lot going on with COVID-19. I think at a very, very, um, at a universal level, first of all, what we need to understand is that the uncertainty, the uncertainty that a pandemic brings, um, the sense of powerlessness that people have in the face of an invisible virus that is causing, um, uh, you know, having devastating consequences on their relatives, uh, their family. These leaves people. Uh, these these factors leave people open to misinformation and, in particular, um, disinformation. And so, the way we define misinformation versus disinformation is that misinformation is is not deliberately produced. It can be confusing. Uh, it can it can um, <clears throat> get into the mix of of normal information and make it difficult for people to understand. But disinformation is is what one researcher called weaponized health information in this context. So it's deliberately produced uh, misinformation. And what we're seeing uh, in COVID-19 is circulation of conspiracy theories that have been deliberately created and um, deliberately and carefully designed to uh, play upon people's feelings of uncertainty, uh, their feelings of powerlessness, which we know are the underpinning, the psychological underpinnings of people's beliefs in conspiracy theories. But 
The second point, and I'll make three points. The second point is trust. And as we see different countries responding in different ways um, to, this, to this crisis, to this public health crisis, we see often that uh, poor communication, um, some poor decisions undermine public trust. And we know that this will have an ongoing challenge, be an ongoing challenge for immunization programs. So let's not never forget um, the idea of, of losing trust um, in populations. Um, but I think the last and most important question here, and what I'd like to leave everybody with in my one comment here before I hand over to the panel, is that we get very focused, we can become very focused on disinformation and conspiracy theories. And that can mean that we can miss the many, many questions that those people who may be in the accepting group, who may be somewhat hesitant but still vaccinate, who may be ready to perhaps not accept one vaccine, the questions that those people have that are out there in, in uh, social, uh, on social platforms, um, sometimes bubbling up in the media and certainly bubbling up in communities. And so I think the biggest communication challenge that we have among COVID-19 is ensuring that we're listening to people still and understanding those who are not necessarily against vaccination, understanding the questions they have and answering those questions for them. Now, before I go to the second question, I'd just like to hand over to just, just see if Adolphus or Kelly or Bruce, if you had any comments on the, the communication challenges amid COVID-19. I just have one. I think I want to build on to your comment about confusion. Um, you know, what we're seeing now is unprecedented in a lot of ways, and that the amount of science, I'll just call it the amount of science that is bubbling forward every day, every hour, is really quite, is quite difficult to digest. This is the classic, you know, we're drinking from a fire hose. And so we know that science is iterative, that often if you're going down one path, you find out that that was a dead end, you go to another path. We're now seeing this in real time. So as a result, everybody is seeing what scientists are used to seeing, is, is this continuing pivot, another hypothesis, trying to get to truth. And I think that's a very difficult thing to, to handle. Because as a result, you see, you see this constant flow of information. Sometimes it's contradictory. Sometimes it evolves because you learn something new and it seems to have contradicted something before. You come back and you think you can't figure it out. And there are, there are too many examples of this where evolving science has implications on policies. And if you're standing back, you think these people have no idea what they're talking about because last week they told us this and now they're telling us this. I think that's the nature, we're, we're, we're used to seeing that and we sort of know how to temporize those things. Uh, a comment that used to come from the CDC when they were more vocal early on was, we're gonna tell you what we know, we're gonna tell you what we don't know, and we're gonna tell you what we're doing to fill in what we don't know. And we also know that as we fill these things, things are likely to change. That's an important set point that is sort of got lost in all this. So I only say that Angus is, there's, there is ample confusion out there uh, there is plenty of reason for it. That doesn't make it any easier, but that makes the communications much more tricky. Over to you and I, I, back to, to Kelly and Adolphus for their comments. Thanks, Bruce. I think that you, you really hit the nail on the head with respect to the what we call crisis and emergency risk communication that's not happening here. Back in my early days at CDC, I was on the front lines of the anthrax attacks after 9-11, and, and that was so such an important part of that time of uncertainty and fear was helping people understand what we were learning and to expect that as we learn more, we would be changing our recommendations, you know, all those things you mentioned. And we haven't seen that sort of effective public health communication with this response. And it's been quite challenging for all of us to see that we haven't been able to have a single unified message behind uh, public health leading the, the messaging. And so um, with, the, with, with political partisanship coming into play in the midst of all of this, uh, where we uh, are used to focusing on public health, and although public health is always inherently political to some extent, um, this has really complicated matters because we've been contending with competing messages uh, from people who are trusted by different parts of society instead of having a single unified message, and, and that is complicating matters when you layer that on top of um, the, the usual moving target that is learning about a new virus and trying to develop a new vaccine. 
So I am still working out how to address those challenges. I, I think that if we, we, we know what we should be doing and we just need to keep making our efforts to get back to that with the communication focus on the science and on bringing the public along with us. Importantly, letting them know that it's okay to have questions right now. You know, I have questions that that's the nature of where we are in this process. Um, so, so certainty and complete confidence in a vaccine that has yet to be tested um, is, is unreasonable and we shouldn't be teaching people, we shouldn't have people expecting that they're supposed to say, yes, I absolutely want this vaccine no matter what, when we don't even know how it works or what its side effect profile might look like. So um, I'm trying to help normalize having questions and showing people the path to how we get answers now that they're seeing behind the scientific curtain, if you will, and, and how the sausage is made. And, and so that's a little distressing for everybody, but we need to help them see how that leads to good results eventually. They're just seeing the process for the first time in many cases. Over to you. Thanks, Kelly, yeah. It, I think it's hard for people to accept that, that scientific advancement is built on uncertainty. <laughs> and part of the reason is uh, that we do tend to speak with certainty uh, when perhaps we shouldn't as much. Um, I wanted to loop to the anti-vaccine uh, lobby question, but just before we leave, what are the communication challenges? If, if it might help folks, the way that um, we at UNICEF are breaking down the challenges um, of, or the, the challenge of COVID-19 or the impact of COVID-19 on immunization um, is really in, in three big buckets. The first one is misinformation, disinformation that we're talking a lot about today. Um, the second one is the, more, the broader impact on vaccine acceptance and demand that could be impacted by, for example, as I touched upon, uh, eroded public trust uh, from the way that authorities are handling this crisis. And then the third one that, we're, that we think about is uh, looking ahead to the introduction of a, of a COVID or multiple um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And so that's how we are organizing our research questions and our activities around those three big themes. And that might help people to break things down as well. I wanted to just loop to the question of anti-vaccine lobbies. Uh, what is the role of anti-vaccine lobbies? Um, so what we know about, uh, what we've seen, so, so I guess, as Kelly referred to in many, many public health crises, we have this level of uncertainty and that makes communications difficult, but we do know how to communicate. If, if we follow the practices, the best practices, we know what to do. Um, one of the challenges we have with immunization programs is that we do have active opponents to immunization programs. Um, sometimes we overstate their influence, but it does seem that they're gaining, they are indeed gaining in influence uh, it, recently. And, um, they have been surfing uh, the COVID wave of uncertainty uh, to gain a lot of, a lot of um, uh, views and a lot of followers. So a study done by uh, partners of ours, Public Good Projects, indicated that uh, the number of vaccine critical posts uh, from between, I think, May and June, so you know, from the beginning of the pandemic, had more than doubled in, in the English uh, social uh, platform, so in English on social platforms. Uh, far more than doubled, and um, they were, they'd been seen uh, well over five billion times. So um, we've seen um, vaccine critical groups um, start to create narratives that um, uh, tie in people's concerns and interest with COVID to get attention. We've also seen that those who are creating conspiracy theories or disinformation narratives around COVID are tying vaccination into them as well. And that's because um, um, they have a, a clear understanding that vaccination is a polarizing issue. If we were to say one thing about anti-vaccine lobbies versus um, those of us who are pro-vaccine, it should be strategy. So there is increasing evidence that they are strategic in the way that they uh, develop, uh, craft, test messages. And when I say test messages, we have Russians who have been who have been iteratively testing messages on social media. They are strategic in the way that they develop outreach uh, strategies for the dissemination of that information, how they engage uh, with um, people who may be hesitant, how they identify and engage with people who may be hesitant and draw them into the conversations that they're leading. Um, and so if there's one big difference 
um, it's that they have clear strategy at many levels. And I think that those of us on the other side of the fence need to, need to pick up our game and start to match that level of strategy. My last point in relation to anti-vaccine lobbies is, as I said before, they're important, but let's not forget the people who have the questions, um, who may not even be listening to the anti-vaccine lobbies, but because we're so consumed with what they're saying, because we're so consumed with perhaps um, challenging disinformation narratives that are out there, we're not answering their questions. I hand back to the panel for any comments on anti-vaccine lobbies. Actually, let me... Uh, wanna... Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Adolphus. And yeah. then I want to ask you about Ebola, the lessons from Ebola here. Okay, and, and yes, Bruce, let me, let me just comment quickly, and thanks, and Thompson. So the way I, I see um, anti-vaccine lobbyists, I, I see them as no enemy, but yet little action is taken by pro-vaccine lobbies. I mean, that's how I see them. We know that uh, they are threat to, to vaccination services, but I strongly believe that we've not done much to be able to dis disorganize them because I see them as a group of people who are well organized, committed, and have available funding mechanism to perpetrate whatever misinformation or what they believe in to be the right information. So I think we have to take this very seriously especially in the midst of this COVID. I mean, we've, 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 we've all begin to see the extent and the speed at which they are growing. And if nothing is done, this will as well just negatively impact immunization service delivery globally. So I think, I think like I said, these are no enemies, but yet we, we are not tackling or approaching then as, as we shoot and we need to, to rise up. I just want to take on this. Ad Adolphus, actually keep your mic open for a second. I, you know, we're, 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 we're doing, having this conversation in the context of COVID. You've been through a similar set of issues with you know, some of the lessons you've extracted that you can apply the Ebola vaccine experience to this. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. So again, good for us. We've 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 been. I wouldn't call this good, but how be it? The fact that we had Ebola in 2014, 2015, and then in 2015 we were able to use the the Arab BSV in two of the last flat of of EVD as a public health intervention. I think I have some some perspective in terms of how we should tackle or deal with, with communities in the midst of um, COVID. So yeah, Ebola, the, the first thing that we did, and that's why I talked about building and capacitating community leadership or community structure. Liberia's success story as it relates to Ebola is deeply rooted in what we call community ownership, or better still, community taking matters into their own hands. When the communities took matters into their own hands, we saw a downward trend in Ebola cases that subsequently led to us going zero in terms of having confirmed case of Ebola. So I strongly believe that uh, from that experience, if we have to resuscitate or reawaken or regain the level at which we were prior to COVID, community involvement is very critical. But the only way the communities can come in is when you are able to capacitate them as community workers. You must give them the right information because in the absence of engaging them with the right information, you give them multiple options in terms of information that will be at their disposal. That's why you should ensure to be two steps ahead of your, your, your rival. So what we need to do is that look, people are saying there is coronavirus vaccine to kill children. We need to tell you 
why vaccine is important, the benefits that vaccine bring to a nation, a country, a people. So we need to always be ahead in terms of propagating the benefits. And once the communities themselves begin to take charge of this, and here we go with misinformation, they're not going to hear you. They're not going to give you audience. But if we don't give them, if we don't equip them, or we don't capacitate them with the right information, then you find yourself in a cycle of crisis because then it's who to believe versus what they've been told. And so they are in that crisis stage and it becomes very difficult to try. So I think what is critical and what we can take from EBD is capacitating the communities to take immunization into their own hands. Because once they take immunization into their own hands, they will know the benefits associated with the immunization. They will know what it means if misinformation derail their efforts in terms of having a child or children being vaccinated, what that would lead to in terms of outbreaks or re resurgence of outbreaks. And so once we are able to give them all of this information, I mean, we can be assured that we will be able to be ahead of our anti-vaccine lobbyists on the other side. But we need to do this and getting them, taking immunization into their own hands, like I said, requires resources because you have to work through these community structures, give them clear guidance in terms of their direction, talking point, what, is, what are those things that they need to move over vaccination and how they need to even interrogate people who come to give them misinformation about vaccination. What are those questions that they should be able to, to ask? So it's very, very critical. Over, Bruce. Okay, thank you for that. So for the, I, I, I'm gonna go for it, but just to follow up on that one, there was a question about um, other stakeholders involvement, particularly manufacturers. Adolphus has mentioned the importance not only of plans, but of resources for those plans. So for any on the panel, what do you think the role is of manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers, in helping to support some of this work? What are the pros and cons? What are the takeaways um, on, on, on the role of manufacturers who are obviously trying to provide products that are going to solve this problem? Yeah, and Bruce, Bruce, before, I mean, before others can come in, let me just say one thing. So. The lesson we learned from, from Ebola, one of the things that we, we've done is that anyone providing vaccine to Liberia, we encourage you to come in country and provide technical support to the immunization program. So we've done that with Pfizer, we've done that with Merck Pharmaceuticals, where we make you to come in country and hear from the people who provide vaccination services what are the challenges and how you can support in remedying some of these challenges. So it's not just delivery of product and then you stay away. We've, we've, we've been able to successfully bring in Liberia two manufacturers. We brought in Pfizer and then we brought in um, Merck. So I just like to see that. I think it's very critical. Tell your Angus, you want to comment on that? We have got other questions we can get move on to. Maybe just, just a quick comment. Uh, some of you may know that my background, um, I was probably uh, in one of the first positions in any organization in the world that was focused on vaccine hesitancy that was created over 10 years ago. Um, and that was within a vaccine manufacturer. And that was because of that, because that organization understood that um, uh, providing doses was simply not enough and that, um, uh, manuf that, that, that as an organization, that we should, they should play a role um, within a broader um, partnerships and coalitions to support um, immunization rates, to support confidence in vaccination. And I think that the other manufacturers are um, catching up and thinking about that as well. And I think the key point here is not that it's manufacturers or a civil society or a global organization or other private sector companies, et cetera. The key here is that um, what we're looking at is a huge, huge, huge problem that we have failed to solve up until now, and that we will continue to be faced with in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years time. So we need to get it right. And one of the key things to getting this right is massive mobilization of many partners, all of us working together um, towards building public trust in immunization. And so I'd like to bridge there um, to the question uh, on what are the global stakeholders in vaccination doing with owners of popular social media giants? prevent vaccine misinformation. So um, 
uh, as many of you know, um, uh, we have the vaccination demand hub, which is a coordinating mechanism between uh, many of the big uh, global uh, mul um, uh, multi-stakeholder organizations. Um, one of the things we're looking at in there is, is misinformation and more generally um, uh, communication on digital channels. Um, and UNICEF within there is uh, leading a program to develop what we're calling a vaccination demand observatory. Um, at the moment, that's more focused on social listening. But as we move ahead, we're seeing that um, some of the big uh, social media giants are reaching out to many of the global organizations, WHO, Gavi, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UNICEF, etc. Um, to work uh, bilaterally with them on this subject in a kind of piecemeal way. And so we are as, um, as uh, that within that global structure, thinking about how we can start to coordinate the interaction with those uh, social media giants in a more structured and more effective way. One, two, um, to work with them to reduce the levels of misinformation um, and to put into place uh, systemic changes on their platforms so that misinformation um, has a, a less welcoming environment for spread. So that touching upon um, what Adolphus was saying, we need to start taking on uh, or mobilizing against anti-vaccine lobbies. If we look at anti-vaccine lobbies, a lot of it is around, is people making money or with political agendas or trying to polarize societies. Monetize, politicize, polarize. It's not necessarily lobbies, it's often small organizations with very clear ulterior motives, um, which is very frequently money. So one of the things the platforms can do is fact check, as you imagine, and flag misinformation. Another thing they can do is demonetize those channels, those accounts that are making money by generating traffic, by using um, alarming uh, content that often relates to vaccination to bring that traffic. They can take them, they can stop them from making money. They can actually deplatform some of them. They can take them off the platform. Um, and so there are many, many things that those organizations can do. They're starting to do it. It's a bit piecemeal. And I think that um, uh, we need to imagine uh, ongoing, more structured, effective uh, engagement with those organizations to help them to reduce um, the, the, the fertility of social media um, for, for vaccine-related misinformation. So that actually was a, 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 uh, an advertisement for coming attractions. We'll talk about some of the other webinar series coming up, but I think that we'll get into some more depth on, on many of those things. And Angus, we'll leave it to you to give us more details about, about the role of the demand hub and how others can, can be involved in that. Let me, let me get back to, there's, the questions here are really, are really terrific. There are several related to measurement, I'll say. What's the, they, that vaccine hazarding seems to be increasing. Somebody wants to know from Kelly what the, what the number is in the U.S., of, what percentage of people are hesitant in the U.S., and also one on healthcare workers, what to do about healthcare worker hesitancy. So um, let me just, for the panel, to comment on, on how, what we're seeing, how we measure this, what, what we think is... Uh, the noise versus the reality uh, and how we are going to track this over time. Adolphus, you wanna, you're, looking, you're waving your hand or you're stopping somebody? <laughs> Turn your microphone on and let's hear from you. I think, I, I think that um, as Adolphus comes back in, a couple of comments on measurement. Hello? Oh, Hello? There you go. Go ahead. Dodolphus. Yeah, 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 Bruce. Bruce, I didn't get your question. Uh, you were cracking. So please okay. So uh, basically, it's about measurement. Um, is it increasing? How do we know? How do we know if our interventions are making any difference? Kelly, over to you. Sure. Thanks. So a, a couple of uh, there are different ways to measure this. One of the things that um, is important is to measure just based on the outcome. Did they vaccinate? Did they vaccinate on time? People may be hesitant about vaccines, have questions, but still choose to vaccinate when their um, immunization provider, their healthcare provider recommends it strongly. And I think that's one of the important messages that's uh, to take away from this is that 
although social media platforms can spread rumors widely, people listen to folks they know. One of the lessons that came out of the Sabin Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group discussion was how important it is for local trusted folks, particularly those who provide vaccination, to be well informed and give good information because they are typically more influential than an anonymous a person that's not personally known to someone online. And so, um, so the strong recommendations and facilitation of vaccination can overcome hesitancy. And I've seen that over and over again. But some of the ways to measure are simply on-time immunization. Uh, in the US, we have typically immunization requirements for kindergarten entry, and we track that tr over, over time. We can look state by state at how many children are coming in with the vaccines that their state requires for kindergarten entry, and we can measure very small differences in that and trends over time. So that's one area where we've been able to carefully track um, significant consequential issues in vaccine hesitancy or vaccine refusal. Um, and, and then there can also be sort of attitude and knowledge surveys among families, um, but, but the, the easiest ones are simply the vaccine outcomes. Um, in are people putting off vaccination or are people avoiding vaccination uh, that didn't before? And the important thing in part is to follow these trends over time. And um, I personally find that it's useful to, to understand how many people have questions or may be classified as hesitant, but are vaccinated anyway. And uh, what are the factors that led to successful vaccination outcomes despite, despite uh, attitudes of hesitancy? We can learn a lot from that. We've been, we've been um, filtering the questions that people have typed in, but let, I'll have a chance to have people ask. So Ellen Ch Chibika, um, go ahead, please. I think you're unmuted. Or about right. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Go ahead. Uh, All right. Also, what I think, uh, when you said the issue of health workers, I think uh, the issue of health workers, the uh, for hesitancy, like for new vaccines, especially like the new coronavirus vaccine, I think there's need for more information and also some sort of um, research in what they think be it be uh, issue for having them answering questionnaires or also focal group discussions and also informing the leaders first. I think they have to be appraised so that we actually get what what they think about the vaccine. Thank you. I, I think I think it's fair to say that if healthcare workers aren't part of the solution, they'll be part of the problem. So we need to focus on this. Um, yeah, uh, hello. Go ahead, ahead Adolphus. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, to weigh in on the question I talked about, that talks about how do you measure, right? I Please. think I think that was the question, Bruce. Yes. Am I correct? Yes, yes, that's right. All right, yes. all right. So if so again, just 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 drawing in from the Liberia context. So we started to see a downward trend in our immunization coverage from between the between the months of April and May. So for instance, in, in May, our Penta 3 coverage stood at 57%. And as of July 2020, it is at 81%. So that tells you that whatever community engagement interventions that we've instituted beginning to pay off. I mean, is it at the level that we want it to be? I would say no. We need to do more. And so from a librarian perspective, we think that the interventions that we in instituted late May up to July is actually giving us the kind of result we anticipate. And so I'd just like to share. So in terms of measuring whether the intervention is making impact, either you want to look at issue around access and utilization, either for Penta 3 or Mises. So once you are able to determine your coverage prior to your intervention and then the coverage after your intervention, that, that, can, give you, that can give you a better perspective in terms of whether you are making progress or you're not making progress. Over. Yeah, thanks Adolphus. And that, that's fundamental because until 
we know which interventions are having an impact, we can't share those interventions, share that experience with other with others. Um, so it's fundamental to measure. Bruce, now, just, Angus, while you're there, actually, what, if you would indulge uh, on your five A's, I think that's an important, it's been an important concept for me to, to distinguish which lane you're in to know what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. you give an mm -hmm. elevator speech on the five A's? Yeah, I'm, um, so the five A's is a taxonomy that I, I validated as a way of um, understanding why we're getting, why we may have low coverage in an immunization program. And in a sense, it's it's less of a metric and more of a kind of a range finder. It's designed, it's aimed to help us, first of all, really focus um, our, our energies on understanding the problem by breaking the problem down into big chunks. So the five A's um, are access. So I can get to the vaccine or, or the vaccine um, is or is not getting to me. Um, affordability, I can afford the vaccine. Uh, either financially or in opportunity costs. Uh, often it costs a lot more just to get to the clinic, uh, lose a whole day's work because, you're, because the clinic's uh, very slow, uh, find out that there are no vaccines there. Um, awareness, this is what we spend a lot of time on and it's fundamental. People need to know that there are vaccines aware, are available for them. Acceptance, which is the big bit and where we spend a lot of our time thinking, but is not always the biggest, uh, the largest reason for low coverage. And then the fifth A is activation. This came out of a literature review um, that, we, that we did a few years ago. And it's really those little things that we do just to nudge people to get vaccinated. So when everything else is, when I can get to the vaccine or it can get to me, I can pay for it, I know it's there and I'm ready to get vaccinated. Why don't I get vaccinated? Uh, why don't I go to the dentist? You know, I didn't get a reminder or, um, you know, it was a little bit difficult this day. It was a little bit inconvenient. And so those we, I've used in um, with program managers in different countries, I've used that taxonomy as a kind of a range finder for us to first start to focus down on, on where the big problem is. Um, and often it actually helps us um, understand that we were focusing in the wrong place. Uh, so our assumptions were not follow, um, supported by the data. Thanks, thanks for that. I mean, at the bottom line for me is unless you have the right diagnosis, you're not going to have the right treatment. So yeah. know who you are, know what the problem is, and then define it based on that. I think yeah. we're going to, I know that the time is tight and we've got many more questions and lots of interests uh, that we're not going to have time for. Many of these questions, I think, are going to be addressed um, in these upcoming seminars. So let's, let's, we'll wrap up here. Thank you, panelists, for, uh, for all that you've contributed, and we know how to find you, and we know you'll be back. Um, so, uh, Jamie, if we could just advance the last, the last couple of slides, uh, and then we can wrap up for the, for the group. Okay, so I've mentioned this from the beginning. So this is the, this is, you know, the bait and switch, right? We have preview of coming attractions. Uh, we don't have fixed date for these, but the topics that you see here, misinformation, the strategic approach, infodemiology and practice, um, and some of the fact checking, fact finding, and inoculation against disinformation. Um, the idea of, of what works and what doesn't. These are, I think, important concepts to each of these. We've, we've touched on each of these. A little bit, we're going to have in-depth conversations um, with, uh, with the experts uh, in, in, in the coming weeks and months. So stay tuned for those. Again, part of the Boost community. Next slide, please. And I mentioned this from the top, but Boost is, as, as, as Kelly knows better than anybody, is one of the, the charter members of the International Association of Immunization Managers. It was designed with immunization professionals in mind. And the reboot of what's now Boost that's been supported largely by the Gates Foundation was with a focus on leadership and management. There are a lot of tactics involved here. We've talked about strategies, but it's about leadership and management of those on the front lines at both a national and subnational level. And this, and this is really about a community. Uh, and it's really, that's why it's referred to as the Boost community. It's to connect with others who can, and to share their experiences. Those are the things that have worked and didn't. I mean, sharing dilemmas is an important part of it. To learn from others and also to learn from from, from others, not, not necessarily uh, in, in your peer community. Webinars like this, but also we can learn from you. And the importance of leadership, to, to, to have the immunization professionals um, be leaders in their community, and they're gonna lead, to, they're gonna they're provide that leadership not only to those who report to them, but people who don't report to them. And also important about what's referred to as leading up, leading among those who are gonna be relying on the immunization professionals 
um, to, to keep those programs uh, robust. Uh, so that's part of, that's what, that's what the Boost community is about. Here are lots of ways you can get more information. Uh, if you're interested in, if you're not already a member, we'd encourage you to be one so you can be more a part of this community. There are learning groups. We've already mentioned some future events. And importantly, we'd like to hear from all of you, not just the Boost members. So there's a link here to the survey and want to make sure that we've had, I, I think, over 75 people participating um, throughout, throughout today. And there, was, there are many more who are going to be able to watch this subsequently when it's, uh, and it's recorded. But we want to hear from you. So please, please take that survey. Uh, and then the last slide is just to say thank you to the panelists for the great information, the great discussion. And thank you for all the participants for your interest and the many questions we didn't get to, to answer. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be addressing those in some of these future, future um, webinars. But again, part of the Boost community is to connect and share these questions and sh share this information and share all of our experiences. So with that, we'll, we'll sign off for now, knowing that there's more to come. Uh, Angus, Adolphus, Kelly, thank you so much for, for carving out time to give us your expertise and your perspectives. That's it for yeah. today. Yeah, no problem. No problem, Bruce. Okay. All right. And Jamie, thank you for keeping all the trains running. We couldn't have done it without you connecting all these dots behind the behind the curtain like the Wizard of Oz. Okay, so thanks again for everybody and and dial in for these uh, these future webinars and You'll, you'll, by, by looking at the uh, events calendar, you'll see when they're going to be, be, be broadcast. So thanks a lot. Thank you.